You, probably, you, you hear me talk about this all the time. Christianity has its roots in Second Temple and pre-Second Temple Judaism, which is to say that we share a continuity of tradition with the ancient Jews from the time of Jesus and before him. Right? It's really after the time of Jesus that uh, we start seeing a divergence between Christianity and Judaism. Christianity was seen at the time as a new religious movement growing out of Judaism, and but that's a, that's a topic we can have for a whole another day. I don't want to get too bogged down in that. But because we have these Jewish roots, you know, we have the Old Testament, right? We have lots of different liturgical, we have lots of different imagery, spiritual imagery in our churches, which calls back to our Jewish heritage. The divine office is also part of that. In the Jewish tradition, and it still is today, it is custom to say a prayer in the morning, at the beginning of the day, a special morning prayer, and a special evening prayer at the end of the day. A prayer to bless the day as it begins, and a prayer to give thanks now that the day is done. And it's in that spirit, remember Christians are, many Christians start off as Jews. If they're not Jews, they're Gentiles being trained by Jews. And so they take, uh, they've been carrying that same style of daily prayer. That same style of daily prayer. Carrying it with them as Christianity began to grow. Now something interesting happens in about the 4th century. Because what happened in the 4th century when well, we kind of commemorated it today in the liturgy? Who did we celebrate today? Constantine and Helen. Constantine and Helen. So in the, about the 4th century, Constantine made Christianity a permissible religion to practice within the Roman Empire. And because of that, the Christians were no longer being persecuted. And, you know, not being burned at the stake, eaten by lions, crucified, you know, killed them, but you know, all that's pretty nice, but it does come with a certain downside, and that downside is that now it's harder to die a martyr's death. Now before, during the age of the, during the apostolic and post-apostolic ages, that time, the like, first time of the great martyrs, it was, you know, if, how do you show that you're a Christian? You profess Christ and you die before everybody. Then you get killed by you get killed by the powers that be, and it's a great witness to the faith. Well, now if you go out on the street corner and you shout, "I am a Christian," even the Roman pagans go, "Yeah, that's legal. That checks out. Have a nice day, sir." And then they move on. And it's like, well, okay, well, this is going to be a little bit more difficult now to show how much we truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. How much more difficult it is to say that this we have with us the true faith. And so, the growing monastic slash ascetical movement at this time uses these ideas of morning and evening prayer from the Jewish tradition and expands upon them to show their dedication and their devotion to Christ. So, what's the ascetical life? Who knows what an ascetic is? So, an ascetic, or it can refer to a kind of person or to a lifestyle where hurt people take on extreme forms of fasting, of self-deprivation, uh, self-deprivation, and all of it is in a penitential act to try and bring, us, uh, bring the individual closer to God. And this is really what many of the early monks are doing, whether we're talking about Macarius the Great, Anthony of Egypt, right? All Anthony or Macomius, all of these guys are taking on these strict ascetical efforts. And in the, so doing, their ascetical efforts are kind of proving to the world around them, look at how great our God is, look at how great we love Jesus, we love that we love our Christian faith, that we're willing to devote ourselves completely and totally to it. And now people start getting attracted to this idea. They say, yeah, that looks really good. We want to join these communities, and they start joining these monastic communities. And because now you have a monastic community, you need a rule of prayer. And since you have nothing better to do as a monk than to pray all day, you can take that morning prayer and that evening prayer idea, and you can expand upon it. Why should I just pray at one time in the morning when I could pray throughout the morning? Why should I just pray at one time in the evening when I can pray throughout? 
all the way through. Why pray only a little bit in the day when I could pray all day, every day, 24-7? And this is what the monks set out to do. Some of them even endeavored to never fall asleep. Of course, they found that was very difficult and nigh impossible, barring some pretty bad health effects. So they didn't quite make it. But what they wound up doing was they developed a system of keeping different watches in their monastic communities and different offices throughout the course of the day. So that way, even though sometimes some of the monks have to get a rest, or sometimes some of the monks need to eat, sometimes some of the monks need to work, there's always someone praying at a different portion of the day. And this is what the monks landed on. And over time, that developed into what we today understand as the, as the daily cycle of the divine office. And that's what I want us to focus on today. So, the daily cycle begins at what time? What time does the day begin? Sunset. <coughs> Sunset. Sunset. Remember, because Christianity has roots in Judaism. When does, so it's like, okay, if the, Sabbath, if the Sabbath is on Saturday, why am I seeing all the local, you know, I, you know, I live across the synagogue here, so why do I see all these Jews going over to temple on Friday afternoon as the sun's going down? Because sundown in the Jewish system is when the day begins. Same thing for us. The liturgical be day begins at sundown or evening. And that brings us to the first office, Vespers, the service of Vespers. Now, some of us have already been coming to the daily Vespers services that I've been holding on Mondays. And so that gives us an idea of what we're praying for there. So those of you that have been to the Vespers service, what are we praying for? What's the common theme that's in those services? What are those prayers? Praising God. We're praising God, of course. Asking for a blessing, protect us over the night, during the day. Protect us over the night and during the day. We are pondering on creation. That's another big thing, right? It's another big thing. So we have, we pray Psalm 103, right? Which is just a really quick, uh, go, uh, Psalm 103 is a nice uh, recap of creation and all the things that God has made. But why would we want to focus on that? Because if Vespers corresponds to the beginning of the day, we're also giving thanks to God for having created this new day. To brought us to the end of the previous day and into the beginning of a new day. Yes. And we're asking for all sorts of preparation. O Lord, set a guard before my mouth and a portal around my lips. Right? That's Psalm 140, which is prayed at every Vespers service. So, it's preparing us for sleep. Because even though it's the beginning of the day, you start your day with dinner and going to bed, right? <laughs> we have to call to mind that, getting ready to rest. It's also giving thanks to the fact that there's a new day before us. So that's the first office, is Vespers. Now after Vespers, we have something called Compline. Who's ever heard of Compline before? Mary, tell us a little bit about Compline. When do we pray Compline? Before sleep. It is the prayers we say before we turn in for the night. And they're often prayers asking for protection, asking for forgiveness, especially for during Great Compline. Uh, if you do Great Compline in a group, or especially with a priest, there is a litany of forgiveness where the uh, celebrant and the uh, cel uh, the main celebrant and the uh, choir kind of go back and forth asking for mutual forgiveness, kind of like what we do at a Forgiveness Vespers before Great Lent begins, right? So that's uh, Compline. Compline is getting us ready for bed, getting us ready for the night, asking for protection in the night against all those things that lurk about in the darkness, right? Because we know nighttime, is, Christ tells us that when you're, when, yeah, generally when you're out trying to get, I'm paraphrasing here, but generally the people that are out doing something bad, they don't want to get caught doing it. So they do it at night when it's dark. 
Same thing goes with the spiritual powers, demons, right? Same thing sometimes even goes for ourselves. And so we ask for protection against those temptations, protection against those that would do these things to us. That's common. Now after Compton, we have something called the Midnight Office. Who can guess when this takes place? <laughs> Midnight. So, geez, someone is waking up in the middle of the night just to, to pray? That's a very hard dedication, isn't it? I don't want to undermine. Uh, I don't want to undermine the sort of dedication that goes into praying the Midnight Office, especially in today's day and age. But we should also remember that. Sleep cycles, the sleep cycle that we have today is very recent. This is something that comes with the advent of electric lighting, right? Artificial lighting existed in the ancient world, but it existed in the form of candles and oil lamps and, you know, fireplace fires, which are very limited in how well they can illuminate the room, right? Uh, and, of course, if you're burning candles, Either you're burning beeswax, and that's very expensive, or you're burning beef tallow, and it smells awful, or you're burning olive oil, and olive oil has lots of uses, and you need to really kind of ration that, right? So it costs a lot to light up your home. So generally, you only light up your home when you absolutely need to. So if you only light up your home and you absolutely need to, you really are going to, when the sun is down, you're going to bed pretty soon because you can't really see unless you're using up these precious resources. So that means you're going to bed earlier, you're going to bed earlier, you're going to wake up a little bit earlier. So when do you wake up? You wake up at around midnight. And usually you use that time to tend to your fire, uh, double check and make sure everything in the house is okay, maybe you meditate on a dream or something like that. The same thing, but so at this time, the monks decided to use that time for praying. Because they're monks and that's what they do. <laughs> they would not be very good monks if they didn't do it. And the Midnight Office represents for us, it represents vigilance, keeping watch. So we, there is one troparia that we sing during Holy Week, which is also sung at the Midnight Office, the troparian of the Bridegroom, who remembers this one. Behold, the Bridegroom is coming in the middle of the night. Blessed is the servant whom he shall find awake. But, to this, but the servant whom he shall find asleep will not be found worthy of him. This is calling back to Christ's parable, right, about the, about the maidens with the oil lamps, right? There's some maidens that are like, yeah, I've got enough olive oil. I've got enough oil to keep my lamp lit. And there's other maidens like, ah, I don't have enough oil. I'm gonna go make sure I bring some extra oil. And so because they have the extra oil, their lamps don't go out. The maidens that go, ah, oh, no, I mean, I've got enough oil. They go, oh, I ran out of oil. I need to go run out and get some more oil. And while they're gone, who shows up? The bridegroom, this is Christ. We don't know the day or the hour when Jesus is coming back, when the second coming will be. And so that kind of vigilance is needed. And that's what is commemorated at the Midnight Office. After the Midnight Office, now we're getting into the wee hours of the morning, and we come to Matins, or morning prayer. Now, Matins... Matins is such a complex monster of a service. We could probably have like a whole, we could probably have a whole uh, like two or three lessons all on matins. Suffice to say, matins is now is a combination of many different services, uh, including parts of the parts of little bits of the midnight office, uh, parts of a service which is still celebrated in the Roman tradition called wads, and of course itself. And this commemorates so we're waking up early in the morning. These are prayers of perseverance. First of all, because you're not getting enough sleep because you're doing this, because you're do, you're doing this whole thing that the monks are doing, and you're waking up at midnight to do this, right? So you need a little extra kick. But now you're about halfway through the day now, right? If the day began at vespers liturgically, now you're about halfway through. You need that extra oomph, that extra chutzpah to get you through it. Maybe you've already fallen. You've already had some sort of a sin either creep into your mind, or maybe you've just fallen short in some way. I don't know what you could have done if you've just been sleeping and praying the whole time, but who knows? Maybe you feel 
that you're getting ready to break. And so those prayers of perseverance, especially as we see them in the Hexasalms, the first six psalms that are prayed in Matins, these are especially emblematic of that need for perseverance. Then we have the first hour. Now the next, so what, what, this section of the, uh, of the Divine Office is sometimes called the small hours. And for that, I actually kind of want to hand out to you all, because you came, you get freebies. I went to Staples and printed out uh, booklets that have small hours in them. And a service called Typica, which we're not going to talk about today. Does everybody have one? Yep. So by the time we make it to the small hours, now you've entered the work day. The time for sleep is done. You should have had your breakfast, and now there's work to be done. Just because you're a monk or a nun or whatever, right, it doesn't mean that there isn't still work to be done around the monastery, right? And so because there's still work to be done, whether it's cooking for your fellow monastics, whether it's chopping firewood, maybe it's doing some repairs on the monastery, maybe there's a garden that needs to be tended to, right? You want to keep praying throughout the day. You want to keep praying in community throughout the day. But you also know you need to set some time aside for work. So the small hours are much shorter services. They're much shorter services. And each one of them corresponds to a different need throughout the day. The first hour, or prime, which is usually prayed at about 6 a.m. Again, so, so sometimes you'll see people say, like, oh, it's prayed at, at exactly this time, or exactly this time. Well, remember, when these prayers were first being codified, precise clocks, the way we understand them today, that wasn't really a thing. Your clock was the sun, right? Or a moon, if you wanted to be edgy about it. And also didn't want to keep time every time there was a new moon. I'm just saying. <laughs> right? So, the time of day really depended on where the sun was in the sky. And so, the first hour, then, refers to that first hour of watch after daylight. After daylight. And so that's usually when matins would be held. Matins would be held right at dusk. Matins would be held right at dusk. No, sorry, right at dawn. Vespers is at dusk. Excuse me. I got, I got those mixed up. But so about three hours after dawn, that's when the first hour would be celebrated. And the first hour, uh, there's a lot of different uh, debate as to what the first hour could be about. I would wager that it is about the, uh, it's about calling us to remember the demands of righteousness and perfection before God, calling us not to falter as we strive to live out the Christian life. After that, you have the third hour, which is then the next three hours after first hour, and that's and so you're roughly at about nine o'clock in the morning now. Now the third hour calls us to remember the descent of the Holy Spirit upon us, and the constant need for turning to God when we fall short, which we are all prone to do. We read in Scripture, there is no one who has lived and has not sinned. There are two exceptions to this, of course. Christ himself, because he's God, so it's kind of ontologically impossible for him at least in that respect. That's an interesting Christological question which we don't need to talk about right now. That's well beyond the scope of this. And of course, the Blessed Mother. She did not sin. Those are the only two that have never sinned. The rest of us are all guilty of something in some way or another. Anyway, so that's what the third hour is calling us to remind to remind, it's kind of a humbling, it's a very humbling sort of prayer. 
So while I find third hour is, among many people, it's a favorite. It's a favorite of the small hours to pray. Because we all need a little bit of humility, right? If you pray the first hour and you're reading about like all these psalms where the guy's going, oh, you know, God, I've done nothing wrong before you. And it's like, it doesn't sound like me. It does not sound like me. Then you have the sixth hour, which does not occur at six o'clock, unfortunately, but it occurs at about noon. So the sun is at the peak of the day. And we actually read, and so we actually read in the psalms about this thing called the noon day demon. And so these, that's, actually, that's, actually in the, that's actually in the service for the sixth hour, calling us for, to, uh, protect, calling us for protection from that. Because by the time you're at noon, right, think about it. You've been up since matins. You've been up since three-ish in the morning, just praying and working. And now you are exhausted. And now giving in to a little bit of lethargy and all that comes with lethargy that's starting to sound really, really tempting. And so the way the six hour pulls us away from that, it calls us to remember when Christ was crucified. Because it was about at the six hour when Jesus was nailed to the cross and raised up on the cross. And that's what we commemorate at the six hour. And now finally, the last office, the ninth hour, which is roughly at around three. This corresponds to when Jesus expired on the cross. Those of you that are familiar with the Roman Catholic tradition, when do you keep silence on Good Friday? From noon to three. Very good. From noon to three. So this commemorates Christ's death and calls us to remember the burial and resurrection. And three hours after ninth hour, what do you have? Vespers. Now we're back at Vespers. <laughs> and you can do it all over again. <laughs> that's a, and that's why it's called the daily cycle. Now, we just went through all of these. What did we notice? There's a really big service in there that we didn't talk about. Or I've mentioned it already in this talk. But it didn't include it in that list. What are we not seeing there? The divine liturgy. The divine liturgy is not considered a part of the divine office. Now, why might that be? It's a standalone service. It's good. Good. Good intuition there. What else? It's done in community. These can also be done. In fact, it's encouraged that these are done in community, but they don't have to be. So there's two big reasons. It's only done once a week. Ah, the divine liturgy. So that's a good. That's a very good question. So the divine liturgy is one meant to be a timeless thing. It's something outside of time. Remember, the divine office is meant to sanctify the different hours of the day. The divine liturgy has a totally different purpose. It's something that brings us out of the time of the day, right? It's, we're stepping away from the world. We're stepping, all of these prayers, all of this divine office, that's happening in chronos, in chronological time. It's sanctifying those chronological orders. The divine liturgy happens in God's time. And because it's happening in God's time, it's something beyond that. And so, yeah, it's a good way to think about it. It's a good way to think about it. There's a second reason. Some days, and this is probably more practical. Now, some days, and we see this a lot more in our Byzantine tradition and in the Eastern traditions than we do in the Roman Catholic tradition, but we have some days which are labeled a liturgical, which means the divine liturgy is not celebrated every single day. Now, this is predominantly, we say this probably most predominantly during uh, Great Lent. But there are other days throughout the year uh, where the divine liturgy is just not prescribed. Again, how that's decided, you have to talk to the monks about that. It's very confusing, and I'm not prepared to speak on it today. But, so if the divine liturgy isn't going to be said every single day, right? 
Does it make sense that there are days where we just don't pray? It doesn't make any sense at all. But the divine office, the daily cycle, that happens every day. Every day there is the divine office. The divine office exists. Exists. And there are special ways that we pray. So those are the true two reasons why the divine liturgy is not really kind of included in that list. What the divine office does is it helps us to appreciate the divine liturgy a lot more. So especially on a day like today, or a pretty standard day, where the Divine Liturgy is celebrated, and you have the daily office, and then you have the Divine Office, the daily cycle, if you're engaging completely in the Divine Office, you are, so like, let's say we did, let's say we all did Vespers last night, or today, and then we all did Compline, and then we all did the Midnight Office, and then Matins, first hour, third hour, sixth hour, Little, it's a little late in the day. It's a little early in the day before we've done that now, right? We've prayed over and over and over again. We've emphasized the different, uh, the different stakira, the different canons that are being commemorated, that are being prayed in these, uh, in these services. And so then when we get to the Divine Liturgy, when we hear about Constantine and Helena, when we read the Gospel, when we encounter Christ in the Gospel, when we encounter Christ in the Eucharist, we've already spent whole day preparing for it. That's that mountain, right? Sure, you can take a you can take a helicopter to the top of the mountain, right? Maybe your legs don't work as well, you know, maybe you got places to be and so you don't have the time to dedicate to climbing the whole mountain, but you really need to see that view. Sure. But is it as rewarding as starting from the base of that mountain, going all the way up through the trails, through all the trees, through all the levels of the mountain? Is it as rewarding than doing all of that. No, you appreciate it a lot more. You see the little bits of the mountain, you see the little bits of the trail. It's been a while since I've gone on a hike, so maybe you can sell where this metaphor is coming from. <laughs> and so then when we get to the top, we can really appreciate that view. We can really appreciate that mountain air. That's what the Divine Office lets us do. That's what the Divine Office is trying to do for it does nothing but enlivens our spiritual lives. It enlivens our self, our liturgical life. It helps us better encounter Christ when we come to meet him in the divine liturgy. That's the purpose of the divine office. And now, I've gone through all of this, and all of this has been in the context of what? Who's praying the divine office? The monks. The monks. Raise your hand if you're a monk. <laughs> I like that attitude. Not, not too far off. <laughs> but we're not monks. We're not professed to a particular monastic rule. We live in the world. We have jobs. We have families. Would I like to pray the divine office all day long? Yeah. Think he'd let me? <laughs> He's lucky he's cute. <laughs> For those of you watching at home, I'm pointing at my, my baby. <laughs> Different things occur in our lives. And so we shouldn't feel bad, like, oh man, I haven't prayed the divine office. I'm somehow like less of a Christian than the monks. And it's like, no, that doesn't make you less of a Christian. It doesn't make you somehow any worse for wear because you haven't prayed it. But just because we are not monks doesn't mean that we should say, oh, well, I don't have to pray that. You should still pray that. You still want to pray, pray that. You should find a time in your day to pray. As priests, it depends on your particular, where, your particular uh, eparchy or diocese, but just about everywhere, you are obliged. Priests are obliged to keep at least an hour of the divine office. And we get a lot of freedom as to how we do that because... Sometimes you're like me, and you have two parishes to take care of, and you know, that's not a lot of time in the day. And sometimes you just you really need to just get off your feet and pray with God the same way St. Joseph did, which is sleep. Mm -hmm. Sometimes <laughs> you need that. But we can all endeavor, right? We can all endeavor to pray this a little bit, because when we do, we realize that 
God wants us to participate with the monks in sanctifying that time, sanctifying the days. That's why, even though we're laity, even though we've probably never been to, some of us may not have ever been to a monastery, actually. I'm pretty sure all of us have been to a monastery. You've been to a monastery? I have. Mm -hmm. The rest of you, I know you've been to monasteries, though, at least once. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, yes. So even, so even though we may not be living in a monastery, even though we may not be living the life of the monks and the nuns, that doesn't mean that we can't participate with them. So how then can we incorporate the divine office into our daily prayer? Because those are a lot, I just give you a lot of pretty words though. That's not going to be very helpful if I was like, well, then how am I supposed to do this? And I've never done it before. Let's say you've never done it before. Maybe some of you have done it before. Uh, I know uh, because Rebelliacs help a lot with uh, praying the, the Vespers service. Some of you have been coming to the Vespers. Some of you come to the first and third hour that I do in the mornings or the sixth hour of what that I do at uh, St. Pius. How can I incorporate that more into my home life, my home prayer life? Start small. Start small. The nice thing about sanctifying the hours of the day is that there's a long list of different things that we can pray. Somewhere in your day, there's going to be a little opening that you can put one of those prayers into. Probably, I would usually start with the small hours, right? Because that comprises the work day. So let's say you're usually busy the first portion of the day, get up a little early, 15 minutes, first hour, boom. And that's it. Maybe you have some time at lunch. I used to do this when I was a teacher, when I taught in, uh, at Marquette in uh, Michigan City. Whenever my lunch hour rolled around, well, it's, about, it's about noon. Pray the six hour first, and then eat lunch. That was, that was the way out, and that's how I did it. You find these little portions in your day. Now, let's say maybe you're working an unusual work schedule, right? Like maybe you work the night shift, or maybe you work, and so you're you're basically sleeping throughout the, the morning. So what's that first that first office? Maybe it turns out to be vespers, or maybe it turns out to be matins. Maybe it's the dreaded midnight office. Midnight office actually isn't that bad. It's quite short, actually. Uh, maybe it's the daily midnight office. And maybe you don't have time to sit down and pray all of matins. Yeah, fun fact about matins, matins can last anywhere from 45 minutes to three hours. <laughs> <laughs> There's, like I said, matins is a monster of a service. It's, uh, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. But you, 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 gotta, you gotta come ready for it. You really gotta come ready. So then what do you do? Well, if it's matins, I would say find the canon, read some of the canon, or read some of the hexasalms. There, because the service is so big, cut out a little chunk of it that's just the right size for what you need, and pray that. As always, make sure you talk about it with your spiritual father first. Always, you know, all, good rule of thumb, no matter what advice Father Michael gives you on prayer, always run it by your spiritual director first. Because sometimes Father Michael makes some blanket generalizations. Doesn't always fit in everybody's life. So make sure you. It's like you know. It's like ask your ask your physician to see if to, to see if this is right for you. <laughs> I think it's right for you. But that's just me. And those are the little ways that we can incorporate the divine office into our daily prayer. Another thing we can do is we can encourage in our church community to pray the divine office more. One of my goals here, both here and at St. Pius, is to eventually get both Holy Spirit and St. Pius to a point where we're at least doing a little bit of the divine office on Sundays, more than just the divine liturgy. It's kind of hard to figure that out right now, but you know. And part of that takes education, right? Part of that gets, is getting people used to those services. 
Part of that is getting people used to those services. But when we engage in Sunday, maybe having done, let's say, even something as small as the third hour, or even just a small portion of mass, we get so much more out of that time on Sunday. You know, I had a, there, there was a group of uh, Coptic Christians that I was talking with. They were looking for a place to uh, do col to uh, host their uh, college ministry liturgies. And so they were talking to us. I think that deal was kind of following through. They might have found uh, a better, better place for themselves. But uh, I was talking to them about how, how does their services work. And for them, their parish does Vespers, Matins, and the Divine Liturgy. They are in church from Saturday through to Sunday. And Sunday they're in church. Like church is an all-day affair. And none of them ever want to leave. And that's the kind of spirit that we should have as well. And it's a spirit we have it. We have it in our books. It's not just like, oh, we should do what the Coptics do. And the Coptics are doing something that we should all be doing. Something that's always been with us. And I think these little booklets that I've given you all will be a nice place to start if you haven't already been doing it already. Any questions before we conclude for today? Maybe not the question, but just a like little comment that we actually can use this 21st century technology that even though we are busy, we all are living in this crazy society of having so many on our plates, so many things uh, going on in our lives, you know, it's good to use as, so let's say, Alexa. Yeah. So, you know, I'm doing dishes and I can say, Alexa, pray the chapel of St. Michael. And I can pray along mm -hmm. with her. Because, you know, it's, it's the community is missing and a prayerful group is not there to just sit and pray and we have to finish some things. But, you know, working and praying at the same time, it gives some benefit also. So maybe looking into it, these little things that we can add Unfortunately, Alex, I will not know hours in Kipika, <laughs> but yeah. maybe we can do something. Yes, yeah, the internet, yes, too. That is a great point. And there are many, uh, there are actually many monasteries that, if they have particularly good choirs, they will record these mm -hmm. services. So, uh, uh, so the, the famous uh, Balam Monastery, which is in uh, Russia, mm -hmm. it's a Russian Orthodox monastery, but they have a beautiful choir. Absolutely beautiful choir. Or even the monks on uh, Mount Athos, or even our own, uh, even in, uh, or, or in uh, Uzra, the Uzra Seminary Choir is wonderful. We had them visit uh, the seminary. We listened, they, so we, we lived with those guys for like a weekend. And uh, they were very nice. They were very nice to us. And we heard them sing. It was gorgeous. And they send out, and they actually have recordings that you could buy. You could pop it in the CD player or uh, in your MP3. And I'm realizing just how out of date I am now with how people listen to music. Yes. Yes, the same recordings from the Presho Seminary yes. in Slovakia. Also, they have a bunch of CDs and very prayerful voices, beautiful harmonies, so also very powerful. And so those are excellent ways. That's a, that's a good point to bring up. So, you know, you've got piles, of, let's say you've got, like, like, so, like, like me, like cleaning in the house is never done, like for me, I just, it's, it's just, there's always something more that you got to clean. Mm -hmm. You put the headphones <laughs> on and you can start listening. To, you can start listening to that. And it's a great way to try and engage in that. So, any other? All right. Thank you. So without any, so let us, let us conclude then one more time with Christ is risen. Mm -hmm. Let's do in, uh, let's do in uh, Slovakia. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Father.